evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out uh, for this uh, very special event uh, with uh, uh, a longtime friend and a spectacular writer, thinker, author, uh, blogger extraordinaire, uh, my, my, my good friend Rod Dreher. Um, before we begin tonight, this is actually, I think, uh, the last event of the academic year for uh, the Constitutional Studies Tocqueville program, uh, which I've been leading as interim director. My, my name is Patrick Benin, and I'm an associate professor of political science here at Notre Dame. Uh, so I wanted to just take the opportunity uh, to ask you to join me in thanking uh, Ms. Jennifer Smith, who's done extraordinary work for us uh, this semester. Jen, who's back there. <laughs> who have ever run a program or any kind of enterprise, uh, I, I can't say enough about how much, uh, how much assistance and really uh, essentially making everything work out there with that this semester, this entire academic year. Um, so, but, but for Jen, I would not uh, probably be uh, up here and still uh, standing uh, after a year of leading this program. Uh, which I've enjoyed, but I'm very, very happy that my friend and colleague, Philip Munoz, will be taking it back over uh, next year. Um, tonight, uh, we're, we're really treated uh, with a talk uh, by, uh, by Rod Dreher, um, who has uh, uh, really been a unique voice, I think, uh, in the contemporary intellectual sphere. Uh, someone who is both learned but also highly accessible. Uh, someone who has a, a extraordinary depth of thinking, uh, but is able to express it in a way that um, you know, certainly non-academics, uh, anyone, any thoughtful, intelligent reader uh, finds him to be, I think, uh, a really profound, uh, distinctive voice uh, on the scene today. Rod uh, grew up, many of you may know this, Rod grew up outside of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in a small town called St. Francisville, uh, where he has returned to, and, and very much of a, uh, a kind of Homeric journey uh, that he's been on. He took a BA in journalism uh, from LSU, a school that is not very good at football, as you all know. Oh, no, nope. all right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Well, they're all right. Uh, he worked uh, for a number of years in, uh, in journalism, including stints writing for the New York Post, uh, for the National Review, uh, and for the Dallas Morning News, before he took a position working for the Templeton Foundation in Philadelphia. Uh, it was while he was at the Dallas Morning, I'm sorry, actually while he was at the National Review, that he wrote a short essay. Uh, he mentioned to his editor at National Review, you know, kind of a flagship conservative journal uh, founded by William F. Buckley, he mentioned to his editor that he was had to leave work early to go pick up some vegetables from the local CSA, uh, which is not the Confederate States of America. <laughs> no. And uh, his editor said, well, that sounds very really lefty of you. Uh, and he began reflecting on the fact that he had all these habits that could be understood to be really lefty, like wearing Birkenstocks. Uh, and he proceeded to write an article about this called Birkenstock Bergians, uh, which eventually was really the genesis of the book, his first book called Crunchy Conservatives, uh, which is really kind of a reflection on conservatism as a kind of way of life. Uh, conservatism as a, as a way of living that conserves, that seeks to conserve uh, our land, our people, our traditions, our ways of life. Um, and, and a book that I think, uh, again, really was uh, distinctive and unique in the political uh, in the, the scene of American politics today. Uh, when he was uh, at Templeton Foundation in Philadelphia, uh, his um, sister was diagnosed uh, with uh, lung cancer. Uh, she hadn't smoked uh, a day of, of her life and lived a fairly healthy outdoors life. Uh, Rod uh, tells the story in his second book, The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, one of the most extraordinary, touching, uh, moving books that I've certainly ever read. Uh, had me just uh, uh, weeping uh, in various of the scenes. His sister uh, really tragically passed away, a young, very young woman. Uh, and Rod at that time, based on the extraordinary outpouring of support uh, and love for Ruthie, who had lived her entire life in St. Francisville, Louisiana, uh, decided with his wife and his family to move back uh, to Louisiana uh, to, to be a part of that community. <coughs> assistance to his family and to uh, his widowed brother-in-law. Um, he, he tells that story very movingly in that book. Uh, and when that book ends, you have a sense of what all is well in the world. Rod has returned uh, home, and like the end of the Odyssey, that we can close the book and know that all is well. And his, 
America and all is well in St. Francisville. Well, I wrote an entire book on the afterlife of the Odyssey, uh, in which it turns out that after the Odyssey, everyone writes books about how hard it is for Odysseus to live in Ithaca, uh, starting with Dante, among others, uh, who, who writes about uh, Odysseus's after journey. And the book that uh, Rod is here to talk about tonight, uh, the book, which I have a copy of right here, <laughs> How Dante uh, Can Save Your Life, is really the the, the fruits of his reflections uh, and his experiences having moved back home and the trials and travails uh, that he experienced there. Uh, the book is uh, available for sale in the back, and Rod has said he'll stay and sign copies if you move uh, to purchase a copy. If everyone wants to buy a copy, there may not be enough, so uh, you may want to make a, a mad rush, those of you sitting in the back or what. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, if, if there's indeed a high demand, we'll, um, we'll get Rod back here. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Roger. Thank you. Well, I have to, uh, I'm very thankful to Patrick for that introduction, but I have a lot of fear that he is going to be sent to the circle of the false counselors in Inferno because I bet he told you guys you're going to get free beer if you came here tonight. <laughs> this is not LSU, people. So. Uh, alas and alack. I'm not a scholar. I'm a witness. I don't, I don't come to you tonight as a scholar about, uh, about the Commedia, about Dante, or anything else. I'm a witness to the power of Dante's poetry to change a life. And in my case, I believe quite literally to save my life. I am the last person I ever, you would ever expect to read the Commedia. I, I, I graduated in journalism and I've been a journalist all my life. I read constantly, but the things I read are nonfiction books. My wife is the fiction person in the family and we've had this ongoing argument for all of our marriage about which is better, <laughs> fiction or nonfiction. And uh, I don't read fiction and I certainly don't read much poetry. But I did read the Commedia by the grace of God and it changed everything for the better. What happened to me was this. Uh, Patrick Deneen told you the story about how in the, in the middle of the journey of my life, I found myself in Philadelphia when my sister Ruthie was uh, stricken with cancer. And I was able to watch from afar while she struggled for 19 months with this cancer in our hometown, a little country town in, on the Mississippi River in South Louisiana. She struggled with immense courage and faith and love and hope. And not only did she struggle in this way, the whole town struggled with her. The outpouring of love for my family and Ruthie and her kids and her husband and my mom and dad during this time was amazing. And it, it changed the way I saw my own life and my life back, the life I had had back in St. Francisville, a town of 1700. I had left there angry and bitter at 16. I had been bullied in high school. Um, my dad and I didn't really get along. He was and is a classic Southern patriarch, self-made man, believes in hierarchy, and he's at the top, and he, he's, oh, let me put this back. He is like the, the emperor, and we all have to obey him. And he was a benign, uh, a, a beneficial uh, monarch of our family when I was a, kid, a little kid, but when I became a teenager, suddenly we clashed all the time, and it was, it was not good what happened. And uh, let me, sorry, let me put this. And so I left. I went to a boarding school uh, in North Louisiana, and I never looked back. I thought, you know, that was, that was then. This was my life in this small town, but it's not a place for me. I ended up spending uh, most of my life on the East Coast and then in Dallas pursuing a career in journalism. I was a chief film critic at the New York Post for a while. I was a columnist. I was an editorial page editor. Uh, of a Sunday commentary section, and I was happy. And I, I maintained good relations with my family. I would go see them two or three times a year. Uh, my sister Ruthie chose to live at home. She married her high school sweetheart, 
She uh, went to work teaching in the local elementary school, the same one we had attended. And she started her family right there across the little gravel road from my mom and dad. I started my family elsewhere. And that was that. And then she was diagnosed with cancer. And I saw this amazing outpouring of what community could mean. My wife, Julie, and I realized watching this that if one of us uh, were to wake up one morning and be told by a doctor, you've got terminal cancer, we wouldn't know what to do. Not, we would not have nearly the same level of support that my sister did, not because people in Philadelphia or Dallas or anywhere else are worse than people in St. Francisville, Louisiana, but because we had not lived there like my sister had. We hadn't lived in any one place long enough. I was following my dream, my, my, my dream of career success from place to place to place, whereas Ruthie stayed planted and, and put, it, put down deep roots and these were the things that carried her through to her death and allowed her to die with a sense of peace, knowing that the, the children and the husband and the family she was leaving behind would be cared for by this community. That powerfully affected me. At her wake in St. Francisville, I, there were over 1,000 people there. We stopped counting at 1,000 because the book ran out, but people were still coming. This in a town of 1,700. People would stop me. I was at the front of the church with my, my family. People would say, sir, you don't know me, but she was my teacher, and here's what she did for me. And I saw, uh, it was a transfiguration of the community in my eyes. I saw that the same sense of close-knit community that, that I'd run away from was actually the thing that was holding my family down there together through this terrible tragedy. My wife and I said, we want to be a part of this now. We have seen something beautiful here. Our hearts were changed, my heart was changed. We went back to Philadelphia, packed up everything, and moved back to Louisiana. So we could be there to help my brother-in-law raise his kids and help my mom and dad, and be helped by them and by the people of the town to become the sort of people we wanted to be. <coughs> well, um, I, I got a book contract to write the story of my sister's life, and I called it The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming because Though she was a Methodist, she reminded me of St. Therese of Lisieux. And uh, because my sister decided to live the one life she was given uh, in a very humble way, but she did so much good by just doing the best she could with what God gave her to do. And I learned from that myself. And I, I thought that this was the happy ending. I wrote most of the book, got ready to turn it in, and then found out from my sister's oldest daughter, Hannah, who was 19, and who has both the curse and the blessing of being the only one in the family who will tell the truth, bluntly. And she said to me, Uncle Rod, I really worry about you and Aunt Julie, that you're not gonna, that everything's not gonna work out for you back here. Like, Why is that? She said, because Mama raised us, her and her sisters, to think of, that you were bad because you left home, you moved away. And Papa, my dad, he reinforced that. I felt, she told me that I was, in, when she told me that I, we were in Paris together, I wanted the earth to open up and swallow me whole. I felt like I'd been made such a fool of, I was so humiliated. Everything I dreamed of all my life of being able to come home and no family and no place, be back in this town where I wanted to live but I felt like I couldn't live. I thought I had it all in my hands and it was suddenly gone. I was so angry and Hannah started crying saying, I should never have told you I said, no, it's important that you told me. It's more important to live in the truth, even if it's painful, than to live a comforting lie. And I had to go back home and figure out how to deal with this. Well, I ended up finishing the book, The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, and I told the truth about what I had learned, how my sister, though a saintly person, it turned out her best friend said that, Rod, you're the only one in, in her entire life she ever treated this way and thought about that way because she thought I had betrayed the family by leaving family in place, turning my back on it. She thought that was the unforgivable sin. And my dad backed her up on this. So I was honest in a little way about the challenges I was facing, but I did have hope that maybe now that I was back, we could begin to heal. It turned out not to be true. It turned out to be a vain hope. Uh, the Lemming children didn't really want to have anything to do with me. My brother-in-law didn't either. And my mom and dad supported them in this. And uh, as my dad put it, we were arguing about it. He said, well, you're not trying hard enough to, to reach out to these kids. I said, what do you mean we're not trying hard enough? I wrote a book in honor of them and their mother. 
you know, we've shared our resources with them. We've invited them over. They just won't come. They want nothing to do with us. And Hannah explained it. And my dad said, well, can you blame them? Y'all are so damn weird. <laughs> and he meant it. So damn weird means not like us in every single way. Because they had a very, my dad and my sister were Bayou Confucians. They believe that the do, one's, per, one's purpose in life is to fulfill your duty. And your duty in the hierarchy is to always stay there, do what your family wants, and be happy whether you're happy or not. And um, so there I was. Uh, I fell into a depression. I became physically ill. I was diagnosed with chronic mononucleosis, the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, I slept m most of the day. I couldn't leave the house some days. My wife homeschools our kids, and she was trying to hold the family together while her husband was down in this, in this ditch, lost in this dark wood of physical incapacitation and depression. Um, I went to see a rheumatologist to see if there was anything more fundamentally wrong with me. Put me through a battery of tests and said, oh, you've got chronic mono, all right, but there's no explanation for it other than intense stress. What are you stressed out about? So I told him. He said, oh, you're going to have to leave Louisiana or you're going to destroy your health. And people with, with chronic mono are 33 to 100 uh, percent more likely to get lymphoma, lymphatic cancer. So my life is really on the line. I said, I can't leave here. I've dragged my wife and kids all over the country. We're here to stay. Besides, my mom and dad, as difficult as it can be with them, they need me. I'm the only one they have left. The doctor looked at me and said, well, you better find inner peace some kind of way. <laughs> so how do I do this? Well, my, my wife told me, you have got to start seeing a therapist. I said, me? No. No therapist. None of this Dr. Phil nonsense for me. I'm too strong for that. She goes, too strong? Look at you. You're in bed most of the day. This, this can't go on. So I had to humble myself and agree to see a therapist. My priest um, gave me a prayer rule that amounted to an hour of contemplative prayer a day because he wanted me to get out of my head. I was so stuck in my head pondering the, the, the meaning of what had happened, this tragedy, this, you know, this, the injustice and of, of what had gone on in my life. My priest said, just quit thinking and pray. Spend an hour a day, and he gave me the rule. That was very hard for me to do because I'm constantly analyzing, but I had no choice but to do it. I had to obey him because I didn't know what else to do. And then one day I was in a bookstore in Baton Rouge, uh, the city about 45 minutes south of where I live, and I was in the poetry section. What I was doing in the poetry section, God only knows. I don't read poetry. But there on the shelf was the Commedia. And I thought, you know, I've always kind of wanted to read that, but I'll never read it. Uh, I don't, because I don't read poetry. I'm not that guy. And it was this monument. It was the Mount Everest of literature. And I, I thought an amateur like me could never scale something like that. But because I was bored and didn't know any better, I pulled it off the shelf and opened it up, started to read. In the middle of the journey of our lives, I came to myself in a dark wood, for I had lost the straight path. I thought, that sounds like me. That sounds familiar. And I kept reading. And I thought, this guy, this character, Dante, is going through a midlife crisis. You know, it's much more serious what happened to him, because by then I knew what had happened to the real life Dante and how he had fallen in Florence from the pinnacle to being a, an impoverished exile. That's a lot more serious than what I had, but I was also exiled. I had been, I'd come home from my exile only to find that I was exiled at the, my, the gates of my father's house and could never cross that boundary. So I, I read the first two <coughs> cantos and thought, this really sounds like something I should read. Could it be that Dante himself is showing up here in this bookstore as the shade of Virgil showed up to Dante the Pilgrim? No, that doesn't happen in real life. I put the book back on the shelf and I went home. But I couldn't quit thinking about it. And finally, I ordered a copy of the translation, took it up, and began to read it. I didn't read it like, like a scholar, though I had scholarly books to help me understand what I was reading when I ran into trouble. I read it like a man who was drowning, who was holding on to anything to try to save his life. I read it as if it were a treasure map or, or a map back home that washed ashore in a bottle on a beach on a desert island in which I was trapped. And I found as I kept reading that 
I was so taken up by this story. I was absorbed by the story. I tell that, that whole story in, in my book, but I'll tell you a couple of ways, a couple of, uh, of the turning points in my journey through the Commedia that really made a difference to me. As you probably know, the, Commedia, the, the Divine Comedy is three books, the, the Inferno, the Journey Through Hell, the Purgatorio, the Journey Up the Seven Story Mountain, and the Paradiso, the Journey Through the Heavens to, to See the Face of God. Uh, the Inferno is, it's all, uh, it's like if you think of it in biblical terms, the inferno is the, the slavery of the Hebrews in Egypt, the purgatorio is the wandering in the desert, and the uh, paradiso is the promised land. Dante the pilgrim, because he's lost in his life and doesn't know what to do, where to go, he has to go through hell, a symbol of going into himself, to see his own sins and to become reacquainted with the reality of sin. This is what had to happen to me. When I sat down the first day with my therapist, he said, I told him the story of my family, and he said, by the time we get finished, you will know that you cannot change your family, but you can change how you react to them. You can change your own heart. And I thought, huh, that sounds like therapy speak, but okay, we'll, we'll give it a shot. Well, so when I went with Dante into the Inferno, I was really going into my own heart, as I, I would discover. The big turning point for me was in the circle of the heretics, where Dante meets uh, uh, Farinata and Cavalcanti. I love Farinata. He is such a magnificent bastard. I just, oh, sorry, kids. Um, he, he's just marvelous, and he's horrible and great. And he's my dad. And I, when I, you know, he's in hell because he loved. Uh, Florence, he loved his status, he loved his city, he loved his family so much that he refused to believe there was an afterlife. Everything was right here in front of me. And so he is condemned to live in, the, in a burning tomb for eternity um, because of this, because he didn't believe in God. Well, my father believes in God, don't get me wrong, but he, my father deified family and place. And this is why he could not accept me, because I once turned my back on it and made, in his mind, an enemy of family and place. But as I was reading I, and watching Dante, the pilgrim, trash talk with, with Farinata back and forth about what are we doing, um, what, are we, uh, what are we doing here in hell, arguing about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, I said, my God, this is me and my dad. My, if my dad is Farinata, there I am. I am Dante, the pilgrim, stuck here in hell because I, I cannot free myself from having this argument with my dad, this argument that's been going on since I was 15 years old. And here I am at home and I'm still doing it. I realized I had the freedom to turn and walk as Dante did, to walk away from it. What I, what I realized too is that I myself had made an idol of family and an idol of place and an idol of my father who is a very good man, a strong man, a compassionate man, but he's not God. And St. Francisville, Louisiana, is not heaven. There is only one God and only one heaven. And I had made the mistake of thinking that the partial good that is family, that is place, was an ultimate good. And that is the main way that I went off the straight path and found myself in the dark wood. I thought that everything would be okay for me if I just came back home and, and was reunited with my family, all would be well. I was wrong. This happened over and over again. I kept, in other parts of the Commedia, I would learn, I would see myself in these centers and say, you know what, I did that. And if I would see members of my family who had given me grief in certain centers, I would also be looking in a mirror because I was every bit as guilty as they were we were all guilty of disordered love. And that was revolutionary for me too, to, under, to accept Dante's understanding of what sin is. It's not rule breaking, it's loving the wrong things or loving the right things in the wrong way. It was right to love my family. It was right for my father and my sister to love our family and our place, but we loved it too much or in a disordered way. And that was, was a result, that resulted in our brokenness. I, when I got to the, uh, in the Purgatorio, you know, you realize at the beginning of the Purgatorio that there, there's only one way to make spiritual progress, and that is humility. 
That is what I was hearing from my priest over and over again in confession. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. <clears throat> it was hard to do because as prideful as my father is, I am my father's son. I'm very prideful too. And I could not give up the quest for justice. I knew that it was wrong the way he treated me, the way they treated me, and I've got to get an apology from them or this will never be right. Well, and I was so angry over this injustice. And it's why I left the Catholic Church too, I should say, back in 2006. I'd been a Catholic for many years and a very ardent Catholic. But when I started writing about the abuse scandal, it devastated me. I could not get over the injustice the bishops were responsible for, what they were doing to families and what they were doing to victims. Uh, my passion for justice overcame me and I, it, it, my Catholic faith dissipated. I became Eastern Orthodox, but I should say not the sort of Orthodox that I was a Catholic. I was a very arrogant Catholic and thought that as long as I had the thoughts okay up here and I had the arguments in place, my faith would be fine. That wasn't the case at all. Um, and my, it, my anger dissolved and my fear dissolved my faith. Well, I was watching it happen again, my anger and my fear over what had happened to my family and the future of me and my wife and kids here in this town when things weren't as I thought they would be. That anger was destroying my soul and destroying my body. That was where the anxiety was coming from. So then I go with Dante on the level of wrath on the, and purgatory on the mountain where <coughs> anger is purged. And he meets Marco, the Lombard. And he says to Marco, you know, they're in the, standing in the smoke with all the, the, the hot sparks around him, and they can't see because that's what wrath is. It, may, it does to you. you. You can't see. You're blind. And Dante says to Marco, tell me why everything is so screwed up back on earth. Why is there so much fighting and discord? And uh, Marco says, brother, the world is blind, and you too come from it. And Marco goes on to explain to him that if you seek the source of disorder and brokenness and violence and anger in the world, it's in your own heart. Fix your heart and then maybe you can get started fixing the world. And in fact, you can't change anything else or anybody else's heart, but you can change your own. I thought, this is the same thing that the therapist told me the first day that I couldn't hear when he said it. I couldn't take it seriously. But with Dante, when Dante said it, and he said it after this long journey that I'd been going with, on with him, and I'd, been, I'd united my heart to his and, and my imagination in a way that I hadn't realized what was going on. Then it took. Then it made a change in me. Then I again went to confession and laid my anger at the foot of the cross in confession and told my priest, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be angry anymore. And he said, why are you angry? I said, because I want justice. He said, what does justice have to do with love? And he challenged me as a Christian to reconsider justice, to reconsider what my responsibility to my family in Louisiana is. Even if they treat me unjustly, I still have to love because Christ loved and Christ asked it of us. And if we're going to have our hearts and our passions and our desires and our loves ordered properly, then I have no choice but to love. That was very, very hard for me to accept. But I knew that my healing, my life, getting out of this dark wood depended on it. And so I resolved to do it. Um, by the time, a lot more happened, but by the time I finished the Commedia, it took me five months to read it because I was reading slowly. I was devouring it, but I was also reading a lot of scholarship so I could understand better what I was reading. But the Commedia itself, if you get a good modern translation, anybody can read it. You need notes to understand what's going on. But um, I was surprised by how accessible it was. I had always thought it would be one of these impenetrable things like the Rosetta Stone that only a scholar can read, but it wasn't. It was a real story about real people who actually, many of them actually lived. And uh, it just made all the difference to me. I, I realized later when I, was, uh, when I was writing the book that the story meant so much. It turns out that neuroscientists have discovered that when they put, uh, put monitors on the heads of research subjects and they hand them uh, a list of moral propositions, like in, in a nonfiction form, ask them to read it, they record their brain response, and then they hand them a fictional story, a narrative that contains the same principles but embedded within a story. Their brains react differently. 
if they are reading about someone walking in the story, the parts of their brain that light up when they themselves walk also light up. And when I discovered that, I could understand how Dante worked his magic on me because I entered into the story with him. I was walking with him in a very real way in my imagination. And it wasn't just me standing outside of something, reading it and analyzing it, because I had all those defenses, all those intellectual defenses set up where nobody could touch me. If the therapist had sat there and told me the exact same things Dante did, I could have batted them all away. I'm expert at deceiving myself. But Dante would not let me deceive myself. I didn't read the Commedia. The Commedia read me. And he, Dante led me over and over again to repentance. And he led me to realize that it doesn't matter what you think up here, or rather it does matter, but it matters more what's in your heart. As Giuseppe Mazzotta at, at Yale, he's a top Dante scholar, says, in the end, this incredibly uh, complex and deep and rich artifact, literary artifact of the high Middle Ages <laughs> is all about conversion of the heart. And that's something that I had never really known. I thought I knew it, but I didn't realize how little I knew until Dante showed it to me and showed me what I needed to do to be healed. When I came out the other end, uh, it was around Christmas time that year, that we, we went into Christmas celebration, and um, I realized two weeks into the new year, I haven't slept in a while. I haven't you know, collapsed and had my daily three-hour nap. And in fact, I'm feeling pretty great. I was healed and didn't see what was coming. And I realized in retrospect that it was all about the Commedia. I believe God healed me. God was, God was the one who healed me. But he used my therapist, he used my priest, and above all, he used Dante Alighieri. This man, this great man who reached across the ocean and across the ocean of time to touch the life of a fat guy who lives in Star Hill, Louisiana and drinks beer and eats crawfish and doesn't read fiction, happened to stumble on the Commedia and that man's heart spoke to my heart and it changed everything. It did not change my situation with my family. They are who they are, but it changed my reaction to them, my relation to them, and it made it easier for me to love them and to not feel crushed by the burden of the failure of family and, and place. Um, I have to say, too, something that's not in the book that I've just written, because it happened after I wrote the book. It happened just recently. But it's a vindication of Dante's therapy. My father is very old and still lives at home in the country. And he's, he's sick. He's on a lot of medication. And he needs me to take him to his doctor's appointments and to refill his pill bottles every week. He's on 16 different meds. Old age is one humiliation after the other. And uh, I took him to get his hair cut on, on uh, Holy Thursday. And on the way back, he was talking about how he knows death is coming soon. And he was very calm talking about it. But I asked him, are you prepared? He goes, I am. I said, well, have you, have you made everything right with all the people you may have heard in life? Have you worked it out with God? Just ordinary questions like that. He said, I don't have anything to repent of. <laughs> And it was not very, not, didn't say it in an arrogant way, just sort of a matter-of-fact way, and, because that, that's how Daddy is, the Bayou Farinata. I said, well, Daddy, you know, I need to tell you, and I, and I went over some of the things that had happened between us. This wasn't the first time we had had that conversation. And I assured him in a calm voice, I love you so much. If I didn't love you, I would have been gone from here. And I've forgiven you because I, 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 because I love you. But you need to work this out with God. You have these sins and other sins too, unrepented. I just think you need to talk to God about it. And we didn't get anywhere with that. And, but it was fine because <laughs> he's like, well, son, you have to understand. And I'm like, no. But anyway, I, I, I was so afraid that I would come across as judgmental and have him doubt that I had forgiven him. Um, and I had asked him to forgive me for the anger I carried in my heart against him. That was another thing Dante did, and I, I talk about it in the book. Dante convicted me to, as a, as a way of laying aside the anger, uh, to go to my father and ask his forgiveness for the anger I had at him, and which he gave me. But anyway, I sat there on the front porch, on the, my dad's back porch with him, and uh, having this conversation on Holy Thursday. Nothing came of it. I told him goodbye, and I went home. 
The next morning, Good Friday, I went over to his house to refill his weekly uh, pill bottles. And he was sitting on his front porch by himself in his rocking chair with his walker next to him reading the paper. And um, I kissed him good morning and went into the house. I was in a big hurry. I had a lot of writing to do that day. And I, I filled his pill bottles. I came back outside and he's sitting there. He took me by the arm and said, very sweetly, I don't know what I would do without you. I said, thank you, Daddy. I appreciate that. It means a lot to me. And I, I really meant it. But he wouldn't let go of my arm. He pulled me down and I kneeled down to be face to face with him and his eyes started to fill with tears and his chin started to quiver. And he said, the, the, the Lord and I, we, we had a long talk last night about my transgressions against you and, and I told him how sorry I was and, and I think he heard me. And I just looked at him and smiled and thanked him and kissed him on the cheek and that was the end of that. I kept waiting for him to say, please forgive me, son. <laughs> but he can't do that because Southern patriarchs of his generation, they cannot lose face. But my dad said, I knew that in his heart, he had confronted the injustice and said he was sorry for it. God forgives him. I forgive him. And so we have peace between us. I'm sorry that didn't happen before I wrote the book, uh, before I finished the book so I could put that in there. But I realized that if I had not done what Dante told me to do and what my priest told me to do and abide with my father in love, not demand justice, I never would have had that moment of reconciliation at the end. So that's the story I had to tell. And I go out to tell this story about Dante, not because I'm a scholar who can tell you, can analyze very deeply what the committee is about, but because, as I said, I'm a witness, I'm somebody who walked this walk with Dante and was completely changed by it in ways I didn't think I could be because I always thought that this was an uns Dan the Commedia was an unscalable mountain. The reason Dante works so well, not only because it's a great story, but because he puts to you three basic existential questions. Where am I? Or four, I should say. Where am I? How did I get here? Where do I need to go? And how do I get there? In Dante's world, and as far as I can tell, I will have to add or defer to the Dante scholars among us to sort this out. He gets this from St. Augustine. We are defined not by what we think, but by what we love. In the end, we either love ourselves or we love God. If we love ourselves, no matter how we, we mediate that love for ourselves through, our, through embracing our passions, we're going to end up in hell. In fact, we are already living in a kind of hell if we choose our own egos over God. But if we love God then we, and we order all the rest of our loves through our love of God, then we gain the world. Uh, to love rightly is that we must put God first. But this is not simply a matter of rearranging our thoughts. I made that mistake once. This is a matter of rearranging our lives, the way we pray, the way we, we our habits from day from sun up to sundown, the way we move through our days and nights. The goal is not to feel better about ourselves. And I think this is one, re one way Dante's moral vision and theological vision is so revolutionary and radical to our time. The faith is not, as Flannery O'Connor said, the faith is not an, a warm blanket. The faith is the cross. Dante knows that God is something that we have to, we, the, the good it comes from God, and God is something we have to aspire to. We have to conform our lives around around God's way and God's will and God's love, not ourselves. Uh, and so the faith can be hard, hard medicine at first. It was for me. I knew that I, I could not get to heaven. I could not even get out of hell and on, get to heaven unless I was willing to take that hard medicine of going up the mountain and repenting. My priest helped me with this. My therapist helped me with this. But Dante led the way. Um, you can't do this on your own. I thought I could, but I could not get out of that dark wood on my own. According to St. Augustine and according to Dante, you need faith, hope, and love. You need faith that there is a reality beyond what you can immediately see. You must have faith that there's something that you will be able to see once you've purified your heart. This is what the committee is about. It's a pilgrimage towards seeing what is there, but we can't perceive because our vision is clouded by an impure heart, a heart that's, uh, that's, that's occluded by the passions, by anger, by selfishness, by egotism. 
Um, so you, first you have to have faith that there is something beyond yourself to see. Then you have to have hope that that ascetic medicine you take, that the repentance, the turning away from yourself, the fasting that you have to do in wh whatever way you do in your life will ultimately result in your healing. This is why the level of, uh, of purgatorio with Ferese and Donati is where the gluttons are purged of their sins was so meaningful to me. The gluttons realize that they're starving and they're so thirsty, but they're happy, they're joyful because they know that their sufferings are only temporary and it's for their own salvation and they have to be patient. This was so helpful to me, clearly not helpful in my, my appetites, but it helped me to be patient with what was going on in my life with the slow work of grace and slowly, slowly, slowly healing me and healing those around me. And finally, if you have to have faith and hope, you have to have love, love for God, the source of all love and goodness. You have to love the holy to propel yourself along, to be drawn along that arduous path toward holiness and wholeness. None of this is easy. It often takes a shock to get started on this pilgrimage. In my case, it took having my deepest delusions shattered by going back home. Uh, it was so, I've never been through anything as painful as the, the year and a half I lived at home after the truth was known. But I thank God for it. I literally thank God for it because it forced me to go into myself and confront the lies I had told myself all my life that had kept me believing that God really didn't love me and that so many other things that I thought were just true facts that couldn't be changed, they weren't. They were lies that I told myself to avoid having to confront my deepest brokenness. The shock of beauty and truth in the Commedia was also key in, making, in, in bringing me out of the results of that first shock. It happened to me when I was 17 years old, when I thought that there was no such thing as faith, uh, as God. I thought that all the religion I'd been raised with was bunk. None of it mattered. Then I, I was on a, a trip to Europe, and I walked into the Chartres Cathedral, and it completely bowled me over. It cracked me to see beauty and holiness like that. I had no categories for it, and I, I walked out of there on a, voy on a journey of discovery and conversion that eventually resulted in me coming into the Catholic Church um, in my early 20s. 30 years later, from, the from that moment at Chartres, when I had lost my Catholic faith, when I had lost uh, my faith in family, it took the shock of another ca medieval cathedral, a cathedral in verse, to restore me in the same way God had used the cathedral at Chartres to do it when I was 17. Uh, God used beauty to, con to convict my heart of truth and to get beyond all the defenses and to tear down all the walls I had built between myself and him. So I'll just say by repeating, I'll end by saying I'm not a scholar but a witness. I saw something beautiful and I saw something true. I saw a story that I, I made my own story. I united myself to Dante's story and it changed my life. It brought me closer to God. It brought me closer to others. And it's a pilgrimage that will not end until the, I will never stop reading the Commedia. When you finish reading the Commedia, it's time to start reading the Commedia again. And it's time to read it, you should read it as if you wanted to save your life. You can read it in the classroom, if that's, and I know some of you here do that. God bless you for that. But non-scholars like me, read it to save your lives. Read it to change your lives. It will make all the difference in the world. Uh, and read it with eyes willing to be surprised and a heart willing to receive the wisdom and the beauty and the truth that is in those 14,233 lines of the most beautiful poetry ever written. Thank you very much. Yeah. We have time for some questions. I don't know what time. We do. Let's, let's go till about 6, 15, 6, 20. Uh, leave some time for uh, books, uh, signings afterwards. Uh, we have a tradition of uh, inviting our undergraduate students to pose the first question or two. Do we have any uh, brave souls ready to wander into the inferno? <laughs> yes. So, could I ask which translation did you read? Oh, and Ralph, I think you should yep. repeat 
Wait, the question is, which translation did I read? Believe it or not, I read two at the same time. I toggled back and forth between Mark Moose's and Robert and Jean Hollander's translation. Those are my favorite translations, but as a non-scholar, I found uh, the Hollander's notes to be overwhelming. Mark Moose's notes were more accessible to me. Uh, I've also liked Anthony Esselin's translation. I, I tell people, though, who are new to the Commedia to find a translation that works for them, because you're going to be with this guy on this trip for a long, long time. So make sure the voice is one that resonates within you. Um, the, one, the ones I would absolutely not recommend, uh, the one is Dorothy Sayers's. I hope, I'm sorry if that's one of your favorites, but my son read it in one of his classes. And I, I, ended up ha I took him to Musa and said, read this. He'll be able to understand it better. Another student? Sure, sure. Anybody have a comment or a question? Oh, yes. Right. Thanks for your remarks. You said that the Commedia is one of the only fiction works that you read at that time, or is it still now? Or well, no, uh, of course. And I, I was telling Professor Montemaggi earlier today, I, of course, am devoted to the fifth gospel, uh, <coughs> known to other people as a confederacy of dunces, <laughs> you know, because I am Ignatius. Um, but uh, no, I, I, it really didn't change me that. And I had to go to my wife, as I so often do, and say, you know what, you were right <laughs> about fiction. Um, I want to, uh, it's opened a new chapter for me, in, uh, so to speak, in, in my relationship to, the, to the, the written word. I still have to read mostly nonfiction for my job, um, and I, I like nonfiction. I want to try the Brothers Karamazov next, um, because I, I've seen what fiction can do. Uh, it's bibliotherapy, you know, the, the book got in t under my skin, the, the, this narrative in a way that no nonfiction book ever had. Anybody else? Yes. You mentioned, uh, obviously, you, you, you read the comedia, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago that one of your sons, you know, read it as part of that. Has everybody <coughs> in your family read it, or, uh, or is, is this kind of a, a shared uh, voyage or a pilgrimage? I, I shared it, my son Matthew. Oh yeah, the, repeat the question. Um, has anyone else in my family read the Commedia, or is this just a, a journey I've been on on my own? And um, it, it's been a journey that my son, my oldest son Matthew, who's 15, he went on it in his classroom, and I went on it with him. I had already read it, but it was so fun to talk with him about it. And uh, just we had discovered the Odyssey together a couple of years earlier, and his classical homeschool tutorial. And you know, a friend of mine pointed out just the other night in Philadelphia, she said, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but you were so excited about the Odyssey when you read that with Matthew two or three years ago. It was probably the Odyssey and seeing how excited you got with that that made you wander into the poetry section that day. I thought, you know, you're probably right. I hadn't even thought about that. But um, that's one of the great things about classical schooling and classical homeschooling is as a parent, as somebody who never encountered this in my education, I'm able to do it with my kids. Um, my wife, Julie, has not read it. Um, and I think she said, I, she, she just gets so sick and tired of me saying, well, every little thing I can relate to Dante. You know, it's like somebody spills the cream at breakfast. You know, it's like that canto where <laughs> I really am like that. And, my son, Matt, has a, a, a very, very slight case of Asperger's. And when he's onto something, he's onto it. Well, he gets that from me. And when I'm onto Dante, it's all Dante, tutto Dante, all the time. So, um, but I, 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 I read my, my two little ones, saw how excited I was by Dante, Lucas, and Nora. They're um, 11 and, and 8. And they wanted me to read the Inferno to them at bedtime. I said, <laughs> But they were insistent, so I got as far as the canto of lust. I said, okay, I'm out. We're not going to do this anymore. But uh, Nora was illustrating it as I read. And we had this beautiful, she, at the end of the canto, she would show me what she had drawn. And it was so sweet. But you would see these sinners in hell. This, they're at the door of hell, abandon all hope. And Nora's like, see that? See? So, so I think uh, we'll wait till they're a little older to share it with them. Yes? Into and you noted. Was there any 
point in reading through the uh, three that you absolutely found pivotal or struck you more heavily than anything else in the text? Which point in reading the three struck me as absolutely pivotal? Well, aside from the, uh, the meeting with Farinata, the encounter with Farinata and Cavalcante, and aside from the moment with Marco on, um, on the Holy Mountain, the meeting with Picarda in Paradiso, where Dante talks with her about justice, and she tells him, in his will is our peace. That was profound for me, really profound because it made me have to stop, have to fall back and see how even injustice in the mortal life can be for the heart that's rightly ordered an occasion of peace. And uh, that was such a challenge to me. We were talking earlier today, Professor Montemaggi and I, about uh, who is the, the character, it's the woman that, who meets and who they look back and laugh at the sins, at sins on earth. Yeah, Kunitsa. Kunitsa. Yeah, they, they laugh in the afterlife in heaven. They look back at their sins on earth because they're perfected now. They don't mourn them. They laugh at them as occasions that led them, as fortunate falls, I suppose, that led them ultimately to repentance and to blessedness. So um, those are really important to me, those moments in going forward and trying to figure out um, what am I aiming for? What is the state? of blessedness that I should try to strive for in dealing with my family and trying to work out to untangle these knots in my family. So I would say those. But I tell people who've never read the Commedia, you're going to find your place in, in the Inferno, in Purgatorio, and in Paradiso. You will find the character or characters who really speak to you. There's also a point on Purgatorio on the mountain where Dante the Pilgrim has, falls into a dream and he sees this, this beautiful woman coming to him and asking him, settle down, be happy with me here. You don't need to go any further. She's revealed to be a hag. She's a witch. She's a siren. And what that is, what that symbolizes is the feeling that I've worked hard enough here. I'll stop short of my journey. I'll settle. I'll settle. I've, I've repented enough. The truth is, you aren't, you've never repented enough. You keep going. Pick yourself up and keep going. Don't be distracted. Um, at the bottom with Casella, when, when at the, they're getting ready to start the journey up the mountain, uh, Dante sees the other pilgrims who have come across, and he sees Casella, a musician he knew back in Florence, he says, play us a song. And so they're on the beach having fun. Um, uh, Cato comes and runs to him and says, get on with it. Come on. This is not the time to party. You've got work to do. That was also a reminder to me that we are on a journey. We cannot stop. We have to keep going. If you stop, you die. You die a spiritual death. Life is a pilgrimage. Man is made to be a pilgrim. There is no stop to repentance. There is no stop to working, uh, to, to opening ourselves to grace. We, we can't stop until the very end. And when I got, would get so worn out and tired of it and would tell my priest, you know what? I'm done. I need to step back. He said, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And there was Dante saying, he's right, you know, you can't stop. You can't stop. And uh, we have to stop and rest because that's what night is on the holy mountain. But when, if you stop and say, I'm just going to enjoy myself permanently here or just hang out for a while, that's when you begin to lose, it, to lose the path. Uh, organizer's privilege. Uh, um, <laughs> Ron, I mean, for many years, uh, starting with your um, book Crunchy Cons, and even uh, and a lot of the temporary blogging you've been doing, you've been writing and reflecting on something that you've come to call the Benedict Option. Uh, you take that, that name from the closing sentences of Alistair McIntyre's great work, After Virtue, our own Alistair McIntyre, who advised at the end of After Virtue that living in, this, uh, in the late imperium of America, uh, that it may be like the time of the late imperium of the Roman Empire, it may be a time uh, to begin thinking about um, a kind of monastic withdrawal from commitments to the imperial project, um, and that we may be waiting for a new and doubtless very different St. Benedict. The idea, the idea in some ways that we need to think about new forms of monasticism suggests, at least in your own thinking, what still resonates as a commitment to a kind of place and a culture and building a kind of community that in the remarks you've given tonight suggests you've uh, perhaps pulled back from, or at least you, you uh, have rethought uh, some aspects of those commitments. 
And I know that you've been thinking about it. In fact, you've disclosed to me tonight you'll be giving a talk on the Benedict Option uh, in the next few days in, in Boston. I'm wondering if I could ask you or press you on the question of whether or not uh, you can reconcile what seem to be these two commitments on the one hand, which I think are, is a challenge that all Christians face, which is in the, on the one hand, how do you create you know, deep-rooted sense of places if that, that Benedict option is something that we need, as Christians need to be thinking about versus this idea of, or maybe not versus, but in, in relationship to the idea of, of the pilgrim and the pilgrimage and being on a, on a journey uh, whose conclusion will only, uh, and, who's, and the home which will only return to uh, after our lives. So I guess I'm, I'm curious about how you think about these, these two projects juxtaposed to each other. I'm sorry, Patrick, it's 559. You said 650. Where's that free beer you promised? I could, I could do this one, though. Uh, the three books I've written, Crunchy Cons, Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, and How Dante Could Save Your Life, I hadn't really thought of them as a trilogy until my friend Patrick uh, brought up uh, in conversation after I got here that they really are kind of a trilogy. And they are about uh, my own pilgrimage to a sense of uh, a, a finding a place on earth, finding a home. I, in Crunchy Cons, the first book I wrote, it's about rootlessness and a sense of homelessness in modern America and how we make ourselves strangers in our own land by moving, moving, moving. And, uh, and I, in the little way of Ruthie Lemming, which I published um, six years later, seven years later, it's about the attempt to, I, I thought I had solved that problem because I went back literally to my home. And as you know, it didn't work out. I realize now it, with how Dante that there is no firm home, no permanent home, no, no utopia on this planet, in this life. Uh, I, I love the part in, the, in the, the Purgatorio when they get to the earthly paradise at the top of the holy mountain. And um, Matilda tells them that, you know, that any time people on earth in the mortal life dream of the golden age, dream of paradise, they're thinking about Eden. You know, they're nostalgic, but they're nostalgic for a place that doesn't exist in this life. And for me, I had to realize my pilgrimage, the pilgrimage of all of, of us, is a, is a pilgrimage of the spirit, of the imagination, of the heart. I do believe it's important to, be, to plant yourself somewhere and stay there. What my sister did was very, very good. You know, she fulfilled what God's calling to her was. I <coughs> believed then, and I still believe, that I had a calling to be a journalist and to go out into the world, but I also believed and do believe that I was called at that point in my life to go back to my hometown. And I, if, I had, if I had reacted as the doctor told me to, get out of here, save yourself, save your health, I think I would have been untrue to what God was asking me to do. I stayed there and I came to realize we started this little mission church in, out in Star Hill, Louisiana. Believe it or not, you can hear the, uh, the sixth century liturgy of St. John Chrysostom under the oak trees in Star Hill, Louisiana every Sunday. It's so odd, and I'm such a small congregation, but this little church became my real home, became my family, because I realized that my real father is God. You know, and own, my earthly father can only be who he is supposed to be if I order my love for him rightly in the sight of God. And my little church, my church family, they became my home. I realized that if our congregation is so small that if I left there, if Julie and I left there, well, we'd be without a choir director. She's the choir director. And they'd be without the support that our little community needs to keep it going because we're hand to mouth. So I. I believe that I'm called to stay there, I hope, the rest of my life. I hope I can support myself there the rest of my life and build up our little church. I wrote on my blog today about how, in, in preparing this, this talk I'm giving about the so-called Benedict Option, about alternative forms of community that I believe uh, faithful Catholics and other Christians are called to, to construct, uh, to help ourselves remember what it means to be the church, what it means to be Christians, and this a time of post-modernity when we're in so much, there's so much chaos and so much pushing hard against us 
to sever us from our traditions, to sever us from the truth of the gospel. I believe we have to form little communities, not run off to the hills and build walls. I don't think that's Christian. I don't think it's feasible. But we have to re re retire behind, um, behind defensible boundaries. We have to live in some disciplined way, uh, live out the faith, live out the virtues, be open to others, but also remind ourselves in not only what we teach and what we think, but in our liturgical practices and in our daily lives, what it means to be Christian. For me, that requires staying home and staying faithful to this church. And even if sometimes I'd much rather be even here in frigid South Bend than in mosquito-ridden, swampy South Louisiana, as it is right now, I need to be there because the mosquitoes are there for my salvation, because my church is there. <laughs> so I, I think, Patrick, that I, I conceive of the Benedict option as something that paradise is not a place. It can never be a place. It is a state of mind. It is a state of relationship with other people to whom you're committed and, to, and, and whom you will not abandon. I can't abandon my dad, um, even though we do not have this perfect relationship. It's better than it was, but I'm not going to go away from him. I tell this story in, in how Dante, this is it's too long to tell tonight, but you have to get the book. It's a real life ghost story about how my own father, it's funny how this happens in families. In 1994, my, my father's father, Murphy was his name, he died of cancer. He, his dad, my, my father's dad, Murphy, had treated my dad in the same way my dad treated me. My dad, try, his, my grandfather tried to tell, uh, he was being stolen from, his, his wife, his second wife was stealing from him. My dad found this out, tried to warn him. His father called him a, a liar and refused to believe it and continued to treat him um, with disdain. But my dad would not abandon his father. He kept, because there was nobody else to care for him, he kept taking my grandfather to the hospital for his cancer treatments. And he was holding his hand on his deathbed when my grandfather died. Well, I flew in from Washington, D.C. for this funeral, and I was so happy that my grandfather had died because he had been suffering greatly from cancer, but also because I was afraid that our dad, my dad would die first because of all his grief over, ha over his father having turned his back on him. Well, after we buried my grandfather, that's when the poltergeist activity started. And I'll, I tell the story in the book about how we got rid of it. It involves an exorcist, a Cajun exorcist, a uh, priest from the bayou. But uh, what the ultimate story is, it's about forgiveness, and it's about healing, and it's about community, and it's about fidelity. I believe, and, and Father Termini, the priest, and this Cajun grandma who was a seer, told us he, my grandfather, he sees now. He's gone into the afterlife, and he can see that he did something to you and he needs forgiveness. I was sitting there when this happened, we were praying the rosary and this lady said to the priest, and they didn't know any of this story about what had transpired between my grandfather and my dad. And my dad's eyes got big, I said, dad, tell him the story. And he told him the story and the priest looked at my dad and said, well, do you forgive him? My dad said, I do forgive him. And my, the priest said a blessing, said a mass for my grandfather. They had no more trouble at all there. And it was a powerful, powerful witness to the worth of, of abiding. My father abided even in injustice and cared for his father. And God gave us the grace for his, his dad in purgatory, wherever he was, to come back and ask for forgiveness. But I told my dad on that morning that we had the conversation I told you about, I said, let's not be like that. I don't want to be haunted after you go. Um, let's settle this now. Got it. This is a true story. My mom saw it. And there were a lot of people who saw this. So uh, do not think that all of this is made up. This is real. The realm of the spirit is real. God is real. Souls are real. Some form of purgatory. I'm, I'm Eastern Orthodox now. We don't have a doctrine of purgatory. But I believe that there's some middle stage. And uh, so pray for the souls in purgatory as I prayed for my grandfather. Because it's all very real. What Dante says is a fiction. But that, be, that just means it's true at a very much deeper level. So any, any more, any other question? There's lots of ghost stories in South Louisiana, by the way. I think poor Philip Bess has been to my house and had bourbon 
with us, and I bet I made you all listen to some of them. <laughs> so something that you articulated really beautifully in this encounter between yourself and your work and um, this fiction, this literature from Dante, is that at a certain point, all of them were able to kind of um, coalesce or unite in a particular way. And in one sense, you can think about that insofar as they're all kinds of stories, right? Fiction being a story, but also <coughs> in you relating to us, you know, this, this whole experience and movement um, towards grace. So I was, I'm wondering now, you know, going ahead, how has encountering fiction affected then how you take that, you know, need for um, being open to others and for forgiveness, how has that affected your writing as a columnist, as a kind of nonfiction writer, right? I'm, I, I'm not sure I understand. That. How, how has reading fiction affected the way I go about my life as a nonfiction writer? Right. And yeah. Compared to, you know, looking back to uh, other ways in the past that you've addressed, you know, injustices or yeah. thinking about, you know, the, the pre-scandals, like how does that spirit of, of storytelling or of, of the need for... Yeah. How does the spirit of storytelling affect the way I, as a journalist, go about what I write about? That is a great question. And I, I remember... When I wrote this book, The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, it, in a way, it incarnated in a narrative a lot of the things I believe and have thought about and have written about in a nonfiction way, in a more philosophical way or a journalistic way. But here I just told a story. I reported it as intensely as I could and just told my readers what happened. That was so much more powerful, I found. I would have people picked up, and I know this because they called and told me this, they moved back to their hometowns after reading my book. You know, and that was so humbling to me because a, a woman, I gave a talk in Baton Rouge at the old governor's mansion. A woman came and to meet me afterwards and she was crying and said, you gave me my son back, my son and his wife. They were living in Florida and they read that book and said, mama, we're coming home. Thank you for that. And I said, it was just Ruthie. I was given, I just told the story what I had been given. In the same way, I tell a story in How Dante about my uncle Jimmy. Uh, he's my mom's uncle. He was a paper mill worker in West Monroe, Louisiana. You know where Duck Dynasty is? That's where he lived. <clears throat> he was a very modest man. I never really knew him. My mother grew up in a really abusive home um, uh, with a, a father who was a tyrant. And my mom told me that uncle, the only reason she had hope growing up was Uncle Jimmy and his wife, Ann Ethel, were there. And they were good, gentle, simple Baptist people. And my mom and her family would go up and see them once a month. And she said those days were golden because they were so compassionate. I never knew Uncle Jimmy because they lived hours away in North Louisiana. And if you grew up in South Louisiana, you know there be dragons up there in North Louisiana. <laughs> But um, when he died a couple of years ago, my mom said, would you, would you take me to the funeral? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So we drove up to the funeral, and it was in a little red brick Baptist church on the poor side of town within um, sight of the paper mill. And uh, you could tell this town had seen much better days, but this was their church. And we go in there, and I knew these things about Uncle Jimmy, and I, I said how I, there he was in, in the, the coffin, and I said my prayers, but he was a stranger to me. And then I'd never been to a Baptist funeral. At the Baptist funeral, people stood up and gave testimonies about what Uncle Jimmy had meant to them, what the dead had meant to them. And it knocked me out. The stories people told, there was a little old lady behind me who was in well into her 90s, and she had this, this uh, crinkly voice. And she said that her husband, Pee Wee, and Uncle Jimmy had been best friends. They worked at the mill together. And Pee Wee had been killed in a car crash when she was pregnant with their twins. And Jimmy had taken over as a substitute father. And they were all poor working people back then. But because Jimmy loved those boys like his own sons, the only reason they had bicycles and things at Christmas is because Jimmy would buy used bicycles, whatever he could afford, and fix it up for them. And she said those boys had a dad because he loved them. Over and over you would hear this kind of thing. A woman stood up about my age, I'm 48, and she said, I, was, I grew up in this church, I was away from the church for many years, didn't believe in God, but every time I would come back, there would be Brother James and Sister Ethel. They abided, they were there, they existed, they stuck. And she said, and when I eventually came back to the church, in part because of their witness, 
over and over and over. And by the time we got to the end of the funeral, I was sobbing. You know, I, my mom had told me what a good man Jimmy was, but just hearing the stories, and I realized when they carried that man out that a saint was passing by. I told my mom on the way home, I said, God, you know, it just when you see goodness like that in a man's life, and you see the difference he made, it's the same thing I saw with my sister Ruthie, you know. Ruthie had no use for philosophy. I was the philosophy minor. She had no use for that. She lived it. And when you see the difference that she made in people's lives by the way she lived and the way Uncle Jimmy lived, it makes me want to use the gifts God gave me as a storyteller to tell other stories. You know, it's not as much fun to me as writing a polemic or writing an article, uh, an argument, because that's how I was trained and that's what I like. But the things that really change lives are stories and poetry. Well, uh, actually, um, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, Mr. Dreyer's day, we had him up uh, around 8 o'clock this morning when he had breakfast with about eight of our undergraduate students. Uh, he visited my class and spoke to my class for an hour, 15 minutes at 9.30 this morning. We <coughs> swept him over to a midday round table on religious liberty where he, he and uh, Several other of our uh, esteemed faculty and guests uh, gave, I thought, was really wonderful set of discussions uh, on religious liberty and the issues that we're facing. Uh, then he met with a professor from the Italian department for several for an hour or so. That was brutal. Wrote, yeah. That was <laughs> apparently, apparently wrote a few blog posts, and now has uh, given uh, not just uh, a wonderful talk, but a talk after a very rich day on which you've really contributed to the life of this community, and we're, we're deeply appreciative. So um, with, there are books uh, for sale up, up above, and we'll, uh, okay. we'll give uh, Mr. Dreyer an opportunity <coughs> to join you up there if you'd like to have a copy signed or if you have your own copy. And um, Can, can I say one more yeah, thing real please, quick? Yeah. I want to tell you that I was blessed to be able to go to Florence last fall. I went to Florence to see where Dante lived and to see where Cavalcante lived and uh, where the Donati lived. And it, to walk on the streets of Florence and to see that these people that I knew so well from the book, that they had been real people, there was where Juan del Monte was killed and started the Guelph versus Ghibelline War. Here, where I'm standing, is where the assassins hid. It made literature come alive so profoundly to me. And I went to Ravenna and I prayed at Dante's tomb to thank him for what he had given me and to thank God for what he had given me in Dante. And I prayed to Dante, I said, please pray for me to, to the Lord that I will write well of you. I hope I've done that and I hope you'll read the book. Mm -hmm.